to the worship of First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ of Boulder. This morning, during our worship, we will be celebrating communion. So if you haven't already, please take a moment and find some communion elements for yourself. Anything to eat, any kind of bread, and something to drink, juice or water or wine. Friends, as we come together on this Sunday in the season of Pentecost and continue to celebrate God's gift of the Holy Spirit, may we open ourselves as widely as possible, as widely as we can, to let the Spirit come in and take hold of us and fill us anew. May that Spirit come now to give us the wisdom and the courage we need for the living of these days. May that spirit come now with the help we need to move steadily toward being the beloved community God calls us to be. May that spirit bring you peace, Christ's peace, a peace filled with justice and with mercy. Peace be with you. Hey, hey y'all, peace, peace of Christ, Christ be, be with, with you. you. Good morning, the peace of Christ be with you. I wish that the peace of Christ would be with my entire wonderful church family and beyond. Peace be with you! Peace of Christ be with you and also with you. 
Peace be with you. Peace be with you. <laughs> May the peace, peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace 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 be with you. I invite you to now join with me in our gathering prayer. Holy One, to your table you bid us to come. You have set the places, you have poured the wine, and there's always room, you say, for more. And so we come. From the streets and alleys, from the deserts and the hills, from the ravages of poverty and the palaces of privilege, we come. Running, limping, carried, we come. We are bloodied with our wars. We are wearied with our wounds. We carry our dead within us, and we reckon with their ghosts. We hold the seeds of healing. We dream of a new creation. We know the things that make for peace, and we struggle to give them wings. And yet, 
to your table we come, hungering for your bread, thirsting for your wine, singing your song in every language, speaking your name in every tongue, in conflict and in communion, in discord and in desire, we come. O God of wisdom, we come. Amen. Our scripture reading for this day is from Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. He's speaking to an early church, a fledgling church, to a people who are struggling and are in conflict. I invite you to listen now for God's living word in Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 18 to 25. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Wild and creative spirit, we need you. So come to us now. Come quickly. Come to us and fill us. Open our ears, our hearts, our minds, that we may receive the word of hope you have for us this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The great preacher, Fred Craddock tells a story about a newspaper writer whose columns he and his wife enjoyed reading during their time that they lived in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. Her name was Molly Shepard. She was Native American, Northern Cheyenne, and she wrote about her life and the lives of those in her community. Her columns were published in the Kingfisher Free Press in the 1950s and 60s. English was her second language, so her expressions were more colloquial than grammatically correct. But she had a gift with words, and her columns often resembled a kind of poetry. Molly wrote about tribal customs and songs, funerals and giveaways. Her columns were educational and funny, often touching and just plain real. There was one column, however, that Craddock never forgot. It was published on November 27, 1963, following the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. That particular column was the shortest one that Molly ever wrote. This is what it said. Molly has no words for you today. Molly has nothing to write today. Molly has no words today. Molly goes through the house all day saying, oh. In the face of that national tragedy, all Molly could do was groan. Oh. It's the sound any of us make when the sighs are too deep for words, when the pain is too much, when the grief is too heavy. More than 108,000 people in our country have succumbed to the coronavirus, suffocating to death, 
more than 350,000 worldwide. When George Floyd was killed, he cried out, I can't breathe. Oh, it's hard to catch your breath when we see yet again how deeply the racial division in our country cuts, when we recognize how brutal its consequences, how horrifying they are, and how fatal. It's hard to breathe when the cities are on fire, when peaceful protesters are scattered by tear gas, when the very air burns your eyes and chokes your throat, It's hard to breathe when you're tight with anger and overcome with anguish and when your heart is broken and the whole world seems to be falling apart, when the government seems to be broken too. This past week, as the nation was crying out for relief, the White House went dark, symbolically turning away from the urgent matters of the day. Then, when the nation simply took note of the absence, the president threatened to send the U.S. military against its own people to dominate the streets. Afterwards, law enforcement officers pushed and shoved a priest and a seminarian off their church grounds where they had been offering water and granola bars and kindness to passers-by. Police set off concussion grenades and shot rubber bullets and tear-gassed citizens abiding near the church lawfully and peacefully protesting. A show of domination so that the president could have an unencumbered path to use the church and our scriptures for a photo op. Holding a Bible, he didn't open it. He didn't pray. He offered no word of understanding or consolation. He posed, and no one really understands why. Oh, what else is there to say? We add our voices to the poet who groans. We are wearied with our wounds. We are bloodied with our wars. We carry our dead within us, and we reckon with their ghosts. George Floyd should be alive today. Black and brown people should not feel the weight that continues to be pressed upon their necks. We should be able to count on our leaders for a show of concern and some expression of compassion. We know that. We know the things that make for peace. But oh, how we struggle to give them wings. Oh, the Apostle Paul knew something about this groaning too. So did the Christians in Rome to whom he writes his letter. Their community was in conflict. Because of it, Paul says they are suffering, distraught by the disparity between the way things are and the way they ought to be, the chasm between harsh realities and the way God promises things will be. Paul and the fledgling church in Rome both know that when you see that tragic gap between conflict and communion, between discord and harmony, between injustice and a real and lasting peace. When you see how wide it is and how far we still have to go, it can be hard to hold on to hope. It can be hard not to give in to a sense of powerlessness and cynicism, hard not to groan in despair. And yet, as Paul wanted the Christians in Rome to know, if you stay in that gap and look in both directions, you may also hear the sound of another kind. If you bear witness to the truth of the present realities, harsh as they are, awful as they are, if you work toward the way things can be, you may begin to recognize that the groaning can be the sound of a pregnant world in labor. Could it be the sound of a world in the birthing time of transition? Could it be the beginning of a new creation? 
We don't know, but we do know we are impatient for it to be born. We are tired of waiting. We are so weary of our wounds. Even so, I want to hold the encouragement I heard this past week from Bishop William Barber of the Poor People's Campaign. The mourning and the screams make us want to rush from this place, he says, but there is a sense in which right now we must refuse to be comforted so quickly because only if we allow the screams and the tears to shake the very conscience of this nation and call us to repentance, only then can we hope for a better society on the other side of this. If we slow down and take the time to listen to this nation's wounds, they will tell us where to look for hope. The French philosopher and Jesuit priest, Teilhard de Chardin, you may remember, put it this way, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability. That is where we sit, in the midst of instability, in the center, it seems, of liminal time, on a threshold which holds both uncertainty and possibility, both grief and grace. There is hope in our mourning, Reverend Barber says. There is hope in the tears and the shouting, hope in the protests that have gone on for days and days all over in small towns and big cities, Minneapolis and Miami, New York and Los Angeles, Dallas and Denver, Boston and Boulder, and many places around the world. This past week, I read that the sustained grief and national outrage has already led lawmakers in a number of states to consider legislation aimed at overhauling police procedures and systemic inequalities. Measures include a ban on chokeholds in Colorado and a bill aimed at minimizing the use of lethal force in Wisconsin, and a potential repeal of California's 24-year-old ban on affirmative action. Mayors across the country have been called on to pursue police reforms. There is hope in our collective mourning, because within that great grief, there is also a deep yearning for something better, for something more. The letter to the Romans says, we wait with eager longing to experience this fullness God has promised us. But the word in Greek Paul uses to express that sense of expectation is actually much more evocative than eager longing. The word he uses suggests craning your neck to look for what is coming down the road. As one biblical scholar expressed it, it's as if the whole creation is standing on tiptoe, waiting for God's future, a future that is certainly on its way. Picture that. Paul wants us to know that all of creation, human, plant, animal, the cosmos, all of creation is groaning in pain and is waiting, but waiting not with eyes downcast, not with head in hands, not with feet standing flat on the floor. No, as all creation groans, as the whole world waits, it stands on tiptoe with eagerness and expectancy, craning its neck to catch a glimpse of the goodness that is surely coming. Now picture 
the thousands of peaceful protesters standing on their tiptoes, craning their necks to peer into the future. See them in your mind's eye walking down the road together, many of them young adults of every color holding a Black Lives Matter sign in one hand and the seeds of our healing in the other. Listen and learn. Tune into the voices of black people and hear their cries for justice. Listen to the chants of grief and holy frustration. I can't breathe, they say. Say their names. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery. Listen to the groaning. Hear it everywhere. Oh, let that sound fill the air and let it fill your heart and see this in your mind's eye too. Earlier this week in Fayetteville, North Carolina, there was a standoff. Protesters filled the entire four lane road on one side and police in riot gear filled it on the other. Things were getting tense and then suddenly the police began to kneel. All 60-some of them went down on one knee. And then the protesters joined them, kneeling too. And then they began to weep. Protesters wept. Police wept. And in the gap in the middle, they came forward to meet each other. They shook hands. They hugged each other. They pooled their sorrow, they joined in solidarity, they sighed in relief. They looked at each other and saw another human being. They looked into one another's eyes and recognized a beloved child of God. Oh, what if the groans we hear are no longer just the moaning of dying and death? What if along the way as white people stop to listen to black people and as protesters and police lay down together on the ground, the groans turned into something else? What if they became the groans of labor? The sounds of a new creation eager to be born anew in God the size of a dream already beginning to be born. Imagine what it would be like if we were able to see our struggle as kneeling together in humility and prayer, or standing on tiptoe with one another and leaning forward and craning our necks to look expectantly down the road. Imagine what it would be like if we were able to see ourselves moving our struggle out of the funeral home and onto the labor and delivery floor. How might that change the way we prayed in these days? How might it change the way we acted? How might it change our future? Oh, please, dear God, oh. Let it soon be time for that new creation to be born. Let it soon be time to push. Amen.
God of justice, we come to you tired. We come to you frustrated. We come to you with pain in our hearts. We come to you humbly. As we look at the world that you've created, we see that we have not always been good stewards. We see that The beloved kingdom that you invite us into has been too long delayed. We've allowed little things to divide us in big ways, and we pray that your big love draw us together. We ask for forgiveness for all the ways that we contribute to the systems that are not just. And we pray for your grace as we prepare to build new ones. We hold in our hearts right now the family of George Floyd and all those who have lost Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Trayvon Martin, the list goes on and on. And so we pray that we can be a people that makes or helps create and foster a world where this happens no more. That we remember the sacrifices that have been made at the altar of our own selfishness and that those lives lost will not be in vain. And that with the lives that we have, the breath that we still breathe, that we dedicate our lives to the beloved kingdom that we take the gratitude that we have for this community and we project it out into this world, showing what is possible when we make love our highest priority. When we offer ourselves to the law of forgiveness and the law of faith and the law of love that demands us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to forgive those who have done us wrong and to believe in a better way, the way that Jesus walked. And so as we lift up the prayers of our community, praying for those who struggle with depression right now as they witness the world seeming to fall apart, for those who are still challenged by COVID-19 and all its its effects in every single way, for those who are in different types of transitions that they may not be equipped for, we pray for grace and for hope and for love, and for community, and for charity, and for all the good things that you are to enter into our lives. We lift up in prayer Nina Lopez and her aunt Jacqueline Cordero. We lift up in prayer all those who have not offered their names to us for prayer, but who hold your prayers, um, their, their hopes in their hearts. And as we prepare to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, help us to do so with Conviction and with authority, knowing that the beloved kingdom is not just something that we speak 
on our lips, but something that we are. And so as we pray those words, let us do so mindfully, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. to community life, we take pause to remember that the way that we are in community together matters. And so we invite you, if you haven't already, uh, to look in the description below, and you'll find opportunities to uh, connect with us through our friendship pad where you can let us know how we can be in prayer with you. And also there's an opportunity to connect through our online mailing list. We also have a link where you can contribute online to this ongoing ministry that we have together and we've had for the past 150 years. If you haven't already, you should also be able to find a link to the bulletin so that you can download the bulletin and find other opportunities to connect and also to continue to follow along in the service. We're grateful for your presence. We're grateful for your time. And most importantly, we are grateful for your transformation. As you know, this world is in desperate need of transformation right now, and being a part of this community, we believe, helps foster that. And so we thank you, and we look forward to connecting with you. We also want to let you know that after the service this morning, there is an opportunity to connect online for Fellowship Hour on Zoom. If you need to find out how to connect there, just go to the morning email, and there will be a link. And if you haven't um, received that email, if you're not on our email list, then we invite you to just make a message in the friendship pad or also you can make a message or a comment in the chat and let us know and we will make sure that you get a link to commune with us in our fellowship hour where we break into small groups and we have a little bit of a discussion. So we thank you and we look forward to seeing you and we thank you for your time, your talent, your treasure, 
and most importantly, your transformation. Grace and peace. Friends, as we gather around the table, these ordinary elements, this loaf of bread and this pitcher of juice are made holy by our togetherness and by Jesus who invites us to join him at this table. As we share them, these elements become for us the food of heaven, the bread of life and the wine of God's own joy. The parables on this table this morning, this mask and this glove are symbols of our compassion and care, and we bless them this day as well. Friends, as we come together, we give thanks for this holy table in our church home, and we consecrate with love the many tables in our home churches. We give thanks that Jesus joins us wherever we are and offers us the gifts of nourishment and new life. We are the body of Christ, dispersed and gathered at the same time, which is always true, though we do not always see it. Like the grains that become one loaf, like the notes that are woven into a song, like the rain that falls to blend with the sea, we as God's beloved are one body. In your many kitchens and living rooms, rest your hands lightly upon the elements set aside today to be a sacrament. Let us ask God's blessing upon this food and upon all those who are in our prayers this morning. Let us pray together. Holy God, host of this meal, rest upon us as you rested upon water and light, upon earth and creatures, upon human beings, all of us made in your image. Send your spirit of love to bless this bread and bless this cup, to heal the broken world and to give hope to all its people. Risen Christ, live in us that we may live in you. Breathe in us that we may breathe in you. Amen. We remember the Creator blessed all creatures and all human beings with plants of the ground and fruit of the trees. We remember Sarah's hospitality to angels, manna in the wilderness, oil that never gave out, and the psalmist speaking down the ages, taste and see that God is good. We remember. We remember a wedding when the wine did not run out, a picnic on a hillside when 5,000 were fed from a small boy's lunch. We remember a meal cooked by Peter's mother-in-law, Martha's one dish, hospitality, a story about a boy returning home, the fatted calf and the dancing that followed. We remember bread broken on the road to Emmaus and a fish fry on the beach when Jesus called out to his disciples on the water saying, come, have breakfast. We remember how the feast of Passover, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of this bread, remember me. And likewise, after the supper, we remember that Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks, he poured it and he gave it to them. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in forgiveness for the mercy of all. As often as you drink this cup, remember me. Friends, our tables are as various as the ones we remembered, and they are as truly the meal of grace blessed by Creator, Christ, and Spirit. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. And through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ brings. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, this is the cup of mercy poured out for you and for all. Friends, the bread we break, the cup we drink, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take and eat, for all things are now ready.
Let us pray. Eternal God, in gratitude, in deep gratitude for these moments and this meal, for your love and for this life we share, we give ourselves to you. By the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us faithful to your will. Ask much of us and encourage many through us, so that whether we are gathered or scattered, we may be the servant church of the servant Christ, whose gospel we proclaim. Amen.
These days, as the protests linger and the vigils of grief continue, I invite us to hold on to the charge we have received, to refuse to be comforted too quickly. Let us take the time to listen to our nation's wounds and its call to repentance. Let us find ourselves standing on tiptoe, craning our necks, looking with eager longing for God's future to come down the road to meet us. May our groans of grief be transformed by God's spirit into groans of labor, the sounds of a new creation eager to be born in us. And as we go from worship, friends, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.